everyone on Facebook and joining us on Zoom. We'll go ahead with our usual introduction. We begin with our acknowledgement that Crow Canyon acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our campus sits. Our mission-related work is not possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and, indig ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all Indigenous people, and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Let's see. I know we are all Zoom experts, but just a quick reminder to pop your questions in the Q&A instead of the chat so that they don't get lost and we can do our best to get them all answered. We're live streaming on Facebook if Zoom gives you some trouble, and you can go back and watch this again and other of our webinars on our YouTube channel. So please join. We have our friend uh, next week, uh, Dr. Mike Adler, coming uh, to talk to us about managing change in the ancestral Pueblo world. So please come and listen to Dr. Adler. Uh, and before we start, just a huge thank you. We had so many people who attended our 40th anniversary conference last week. It was unbelievable, uh, spectacular. Everyone who joined us, all of our speakers, our staff who worked their tails off for that conference. Um, uh, somewhere along Friday evening, I was going, this is amazing. We should do this more often. And then by the end, <laughs> by, by Sunday morning, I was a little pooped, as was everybody Sheep. else. But thank you so much. It was, it was spectacular. We're still processing everything that we learned and discussed there. And we'll be seeing some, uh, some pictures uh, and, some, and some thoughts about that coming to your email and social media and mailbox. And thank you to everyone for your generosity. Crow Canyon does not work without uh, your contributions um, to our annual fund, to webinars, to the conference, to all of our departments. We are just so incredibly grateful for all of you here at Crow Canyon. Without further ado, you heard us chit-chatting a little bit in the beginning, uh, but we are really excited to hear from uh, Jim Christophic, who grew up on the Navajo Reservation in northeastern Arizona and has worked on and off the res for more than 20 years as a river guide, journalist, ranch hand, national park ranger, horticulturalist, construction worker, and oral historian. In 2018, he was named the National Teacher of the Year by the Johnson O'Malley Association. He has written for the Navajo Times, Arizona Highways, Native of People's Magazine, High Country News, Parabola, and Travel and Leisure Magazine. He is the recent author of House Gods, Sustainable Buildings and Renegade Builders, as we were chatting about just before we got started. Uh, he co-authored with Edison Esquites, uh, Send a Runner, a Navajo Honors the Long Walk, which was named the Southwest Book of the Year and earned a book list starred review. He also wrote uh, the award-winning books, The Hero Twins, A Navajo English Story of the Monster Slayers, and Navajos Wear Nikes, A Reservation Life, both published by UNM Press. And as we were talking about, he is making his adobe homes in Taos, New Mexico. Thank you so much for uh, coming to share with us today. Oh, thank you. Too. Thank you so much. And Taylor, I think, is going to run the PowerPoint. All right. I yes. will step back and turn it over to you. Oh, great. Well, thank you all for being here. Very much appreciate it. And uh, I thought what we would do this afternoon is go through some images from this project that I worked on for about 12 years, which is which formed into a book called Medicine Women, uh, the story of the first Native American nursing school. And so this image you're seeing here is uh, from the campus of uh, Ganado Mission, which is in northern Arizona. Uh, it's still there. And some of these uh, images of what you're seeing, some of the buildings are still there. Some of the trees have changed and the campus has changed. But uh, what you're seeing here in this black and white photo would have been pretty similar to what I saw when I grew up there, because that is where I grew up on the Navajo Reservation or Navajo Nation in Ganado, Arizona. My mother was a nurse at that hospital. And seeing photographs like what you're seeing here uh, were what fascinated me at the age of nine years old. I was a Boy Scout in Ganado. And 
what the building you're seeing in the background, you'll see some doors, a stone building that's uh, near that sign that says Practical Christianity in Action. And that's the church there in Ganado. And behind that is a two-story adobe building. It's the largest adobe building in Northern Arizona. And it's a cafeteria. And it was called Cafe Sage when I was living there. And they uh, would set it up so that uh, they, they did a lot of meetings there. They actually had a cafe, like it, you know, they served two, three meals a day, and it was a profitable venture for them. And we would have our Boy Scout meetings, and someone had set up a small museum off to the side and had photographs like this of these people in the past walking through this place that I knew very well as a boy. And the fact that that could happen and that that history was intact was very interesting to me. And because I love where I'm from uh, very much, love Ganado, very beautiful, I decided to investigate and learn more about this because so many people in Ganado, they know the history of that place from their family's perspective. Many of their aunts went to school there, their uncles went to school there or worked for the mission, Ganado mission but they don't know the whole expansive connections of all their, how their stories tie into a lot of other stories and into the national story. So part of this effort was to say, well, I'm going to go and, and figure all this out, put this stuff together, and then I'll bring it back to you and you can do with it what you wish. So let's move the slide then. And this is the title of the book, as I mentioned, the story of the first Native American nursing school. So uh, forward slide. Thank you. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a photograph that I took of a sign that used to be placed at the Route 40 junction near Wide Ruins, Arizona, just south of Ganado. It's not too far from Petrified Forest and Painted Desert. And you have this sign that says, largest Indian mission in America, which is true. At that time, this kind of bombastic font and this energy from the sign came out of the mind of Dr. Clarence Salisbury, who was a very dynamic personality. Uh, he was a very humanitarian human being. He was a, a Canadian who moved to uh, New York, where he received his doctor's training. And he went and served on the island of Hainan in China for almost 20 years he returned to the States and took up the position there at Ganado. The, this sign you're seeing is a second generation sign, though. The original sign said, largest Indian mission in America, Ganado Mission, Ganado, Arizona, 40 miles straight north over the worst roads in the state of Arizona. And he would put that on there to embarrass the government into improving the road. And he did so in a very bold way. So that was like, he was, I, I wish I could get a photo of that sign. I've seen pictures of it that are black and white, but this was uh, live. This sign, I do not know what has become of it, but I got a good photo of it to show how the place was showcased in the 19, this would be late 1940s, early 1950s, the School of Nursing, the community centers and the high school that were state accredited. So, uh, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is uh, an image of Fort Defiance. And this is where the Presbyterian Church first encountered Navajo people. And this happened about 10 years after the Long Walk. They, they, they came out there and uh, 1868, Navajo people had returned. Presbyterians came out not too long after, tried to establish a hospital, a missionary station. But there were many uh, forces at work that really kept them from wanting to go to that fort because it had been a site of the war. The act, you know, people had died there, people, battles were fought there. There was a lot of bad blood at this place. And uh, the government eventually set up a headquarters there, which it, it's still there to this day, not too far from there. Um, and they had a, you know, the, the, the government hospital was built on these grounds, but uh, people were not coming in to see this Presbyterian mission uh, and this missionary who were there. And so that folded and really nobody tried coming back out there again to do any kind of medical work. 
or any kind of um, proselytizing or mission work uh, uh, for quite a while. And it wasn't really until the 1900s, the turn of the century, about 20 years later, that someone did that. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And the, the person who did that, uh, this all came out of the church in Flagstaff, the Presbyterian Church in Flagstaff. And so uh, these elders from that church went and found a man who had experience as a successful missionary. Today, you'd call him like a social justice advocate. His name was William Riley Johnston. And I'll show him to you in, in, in a moment. But he was from Kansas and he had spent his teenage years in those kind of like micro terrorist wars that were going on in Kansas. It was like the dress rehearsal for the Civil War, they call it. And there's a lot of brutal fighting there during the Civil War, off and on. And, um, and so he, that was his teenage year. That's what he grew up in. And after the war was over, he came out to Navajo country and he was particularly uh, in a spot called called Chaco, which is, it doesn't really exist anymore. You can find ruins of it if you're intrepid enough to go off the highway and look for them. But they're more or less near the little Colorado River, near the Grand Canyon. And there was a lot of border disputes there. You had cowboys murdering Navajo families, poisoning them to death, murdering Navajo sheep, their livelihood. You had uh, Mormon settlers who were trying to pit Navajos against Hopis to, dry, to fight each other and drive each other off their land. Uh, you had cowboys killing Navajo cowboys and Navajos killing Anglo cowboys in return. And so he had uh, contacted the Native American uh, Rights Association to find legal representation for many of these people in those cases and for his good works. Uh, the churches who were employing him to go out there uh, duly uh, dismissed him and he was uh, kind of no longer supported by them for the hassle he was creating. Uh, so he came back again as an independent missionary, and he was asked by the Presbyterian Church to find a place for their mission. And so William Riley Johnston rode north out of Flagstaff and came to the place where this man lived in this slide, who is uh, Juan Lorenzo Hubble. And Juan Lorenzo Hubble was a very interesting person. There's uh, uh, Martha Blue has written a book about him called Indian Trader. Very interesting personality, a man of his time, uh, who was Hispanic. He did not learn English till he was 14. His father was a Connecticut native who had come out with the army during the Mexican War, stayed married into the Gutierrez family in Pajarito. Their, their uh, house is still there in Pajarito. It's called the Hubble Gutierrez home. And as a young man, he traveled out west and uh, had some encounters with uh, Mormon families that were not too uh, PG-13 rated even. They were pretty violent. Uh, he served as a clerk with the army, eventually became an interpreter because he could speak Spanish. Many Navajo men at that time could speak Spanish also. He could speak some Navajo, but many of the, what we call Natani, you know, like a chieftain, they could they could speak Spanish as well because they interacted with the Spanish all the time. And so he, uh, helped settle many, many disputes with a local uh, chieftain, you call him, uh, named, they call him Ganado Mucho or Totsone uh, Hastin. And so he was a trusted individual who also served with that chieftain during what they call the Witch Purge of 1878, where, example, I'm teaching the Crucible right now about the Salem Witch Trials. And those happened in 1692, and about 19 people were killed during those during that summer. Uh, the 1878 scenario, you had Navajo witches making war on other Navajo witches, medicine men getting involved back and forth depending on what their allegiance was. And uh, there was a dispute among the people about whether to go to war with the Americans again. One faction said, we're not doing that. They're going to put us through another long walk. The other faction said, well, we're doing it. And so those Navajos who did not want war again had to kill those other Navajos who did. And it's, they call it the witch purge and about 45 to 50 people were killed during that summer in that war. And the army uh, intervened in the end uh, in what they call the Tunicha Mountains, which is that stretch of mountain between uh, the Chusca Mountains and the Carrizo Mountains, uh, right on the New Mexico-Arizona border. 
And he was one of the interpreters during that time. Being a trader at the time, he joined the army. Who had he, he had been a uh, you know um, a clerk in the army. He'd been a soldier, and, uh, and and with that settlement that he helped establish, his reputation was very high. And so William Riley Johnston brings these men to Juan Lorenzo Hubble to ask him about could a mission work here. Juan Lorenzo Hubble wanted them to be there. He was a Catholic. But to him, that didn't matter if it was Presbyterian, that was fine. He went to a Presbyterian school. That's where he learned English in Santa Fe. And he uh, really did want a doctor and a school to be there because he knew that would be good for the community. It would increase his prestige. And that building that behind them that you're seeing was built there uh, in the years right after the mission started working there. And, and that building is still there to this day. Okay, uh, next page. Okay, great, thank you. So what you're seeing in this image is a group of men who were uh, that foundational force of Ganado mission. And so the person with the one over his head was a missionary worker named Fred Mitchell, who was originally uh, from the Island of Man and he was uh, British. The man with the four over his head is William Riley Johnston, that the man I described before who'd grown up in Kansas and ran the mission there uh, at Tolchaco. And the, next to him is a man with the five above his head, uh, a local chieftain named, uh, they, they would sometimes call him the Wasatine, like uh, no teeth, like because he, he had a lot of teeth knocked out from fights. And, and uh, he, uh, he was a very trusted man in his area near Little Colorado. And William Riley Johnston, uh, his wife, who is a, put with the seven over her, kind of on her shoulder there, she was uh, much younger than him. Uh, they did have a family, they did have children. They had children they adopted as well, who are Navajo. Uh, but the, the boy you see with the 10 over his uh, side there is Philip. Johnston. The reason we know a lot about William Riley Johnston is Philip Johnston took the time to write a lot of the history, as did his mother, of their experiences at the time. And Philip Johnston is important to know about because uh, he was fluent in Navajo by the time he was a teenager. He knew that invaluable Navajo phrase, which is hashwalyet, hashwalyet, dinek age hashwalyet. Like, how do you say this? Like, why do you say this in Navajo? And so he would ask that of people where he was growing up, where everyone was Navajo, and learned the language very well. And eventually he went on to become an engineer in the uh, Signal Corps, and he was a Marine Corps officer for a period of time. As World War II was uh, kicking up and they knew that they were going to be involved, the United States was going to get involved as a member of the Signal Corps, he pitched the idea, they're like, hey, there's this native language I know pretty well, and like, no one really knows about and Navajo people, very intelligent people. So we should start a program where we, you know, we'll keep it classified, but like we'll get Navajo people and put them in Signal Corps and Marine Corps where, you know, he was a member of and we'll get them on the radio and then it'll be an unbreakable secret code we can use, which was not declassified until 1969, which we now know as the Navajo Code Talkers. So that started, that idea began with this image you're seeing. That's a slice of it where Philip Johnston grew up with Navajo people and he was a Marine Corps officer who brought this idea to the Marine Corps. So, so that's William Riley Johnston's connection to a lot of the uh, lives of uh, Navajo people today. And he was the one who, sol who uh, solidified that alliance with Juan Lorenzo Hubble to put a mission at Ganado with the purpose of doing medical and educational work. So uh, next slide. Uh, the person you're seeing here is a man named Charles Beer Kemper, who was from Catania, Pennsylvania, who came out. He was the first missionary there, and he was known as Enishoretzhose, like the uh, thin priest. He's a thin man, and he was by trade a mason. Uh, many of the people who came out to this area had to have actual, like, real valuable working skills. They had to know how to make roads, how to dig wells. They were fashioning what we now call like 
uh, modern civilization or like a more a more advanced 19th century version of what they'd had there prior. And he was known for uh, setting up many stone buildings. He built the first church there. And one of the one of the things that put me on the path to write this book was I came back to Ganado to learn more about this man. And I knew that he and his wife, his wife could not uh, become pregnant. She had a heart condition that made it so that she couldn't do it. And they had tried several times. And so they adopted two Navajo children with the permission of their families and raised them uh, all the way until they were in their 20s. And uh, I, I was curious about this man and the people he knew. Many, some were alive, some had passed away. Uh, I read a lot of oral histories, but what I basically learned, I think I was 21, 22 at the time. Uh, I didn't know, like, well, what is the connection? You have this Anglo society coming in. Are they imposing Christianity? On what harsh terms are they doing it? How is it happening? So I got into the details of it. And what I learned was that uh, he had gone to Hubble and then Hubble uh, had put together a group of men who were Navajo, local Navajo men who were very trustworthy. Uh, they knew the crafts of stone cutting already and they knew how to work with metal tools. And they traveled with him uh, over to the site and they built the church with him. And all the uh, foremen on that crew, they were also hatashle, the, which is a medicine man. And uh, they would talk, I, I, I wish I could have been on that job site helping uh, with that. That would have been very interesting to see how they interacted with each other. Uh, but that these men who are also hatashle being uh, local leaders in the community working on this structure, it helped people see or, or uh, trust, let's say, the intentions of the Presbyterians who were coming there. So, right, next image. And so this is the this is the building they built this uh, church that's still there to this day. The only thing different is that belfry had to be taken down because it was damaged in the 1960s. Uh, but the the structure itself is still there. Uh, it's now used as a duplex apartment house, and and so the, the the picture says a lot. There are the Navajo young men under the tutelage or the supervision of an of a. Night, let's say like late 20s Navajo man who is there, uh, the future Navajo uh, vice chair of the uh, vice chairman of the Navajo tribe, Howard Gorman, also did that job working with these uh, Navajo young men. And they're being inculcated with, you know, essentially like a, a 19th century Americanism that was going to propel them into the 20th century, because this photo would have been taken about 1920, 1921. Uh, long after Beer Kemper had left the institution, but the, the church was still there and it was eventually used as a recreation hall. Uh, next image. Uh, so the, the, the mission as an institution uh, started with that church, as you see, there it is to the right. And that was a structure that had a hospital in the back. And that was the first institution of modern medicine in that area. To the left is a, a house that was the first structure built there in Ganado in 1903 at, at that mission site. Now, what you can't see, uh, it's to the right and you can't see it in this photo is that there was a Hogan also built there for laborers who would travel in and out or patients who needed to stay the night if they were getting medical care. And it was a Hogan Bajade, uh, which is, the, the, you might see a photo of it later, but it's like a, it's a hogan where the logs aren't like this, but they're like this, like legs. Hogan, but jade means legs, so it's like a leg hogan. And uh, that structure to the left uh, was an adobe brick structure. It's currently condemned, but that is the house I grew up in. And so it's very weird to see it looking so similar, but also very different during a snowstorm. And these photos were taken to show people back east that like this wasn't just some hot arid desert. You know, this is about the same elevation as Taos almost. It's 6,000 feet on the Colorado Plateau. So as people know in Colorado, you know, the, the dynamics of the climate, very different. Okay, next image. And so what you're seeing here is the work of a man who lived in the back of that church you saw previously. He's the one to the right there. His name was Dr. James Kennedy. He was an uh, 
an Irish immigrant. His family had lived in Pennsylvania near, I think it's Greensburg, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he came out there, for, he'd been a doctor in Denver for a while and then decided he wanted to do this work in this rural area. And he was known as the walking doctor. He would, uh, people would not come to the hospital voluntarily. They were living in their camps, working with their sheep. They knew that that's kind of an ER place, like a lot of weird stuff happens. There's sick people are there, you don't wanna go there. So he would go out to them and he would go to camps like you see here, uh, walking distances of five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14 miles. Uh, a man in his late 50s, early 60s, he would just stuff newspapers in his coat and go out with the medicines he knew people needed to treat trachoma, uh, which was a very devastating disease at that time. And his efforts uh, during that time of the flu epidemic were also uh, rather important. Okay, in 1917, 1918, yeah. Okay, yeah, so this image, I included this because this is the sort of image that um, a lot of uh, what you call like proselytizing Christians at that time were pushing against. This is a very strange world that these Navajo people are from. This is an image of one of their gods, one of their many gods that they would call, you know, early, it's interesting because when you read the correspondence and how the Presbyterians were fantasizing about themselves or talking about themselves or thinking about themselves, the time that Dr. Kennedy was there in that early 1920s, there was talk of like, oh, this is devil worship. We've got to save them from the devil that they're worshiping in the, the darkness of ignorance. That, that uh, kind of diction disappears from all the promotional material by the time Dr. Clarence Salisbury shows up in the 30s. In fact, he actually got in a lot of trouble from the Presbyterian Church because he wouldn't be as aggressive with uh, talking about people's different life ways in that way. And I'll get into more detail with that as well. But that's an image of, uh, it comes from a, a dance image of what they call Nayimazana or a monster slayer. So next image. Ah, uh, yes. So what you're seeing here is Dr. Salisbury's achievement. When he arrived, it would have been in 1927. Uh, they drove up from Flagstaff very early got there. His wife almost had a nervous breakdown seeing how intensely rural the place was. It was like way more rural than China. And, uh, but he and, and his wife, who were really a team, his wife was trained to be an attorney. She was very well educated, very dynamic, very intelligent person, a good judge of keeping people motivated. And she was very beloved uh, by former students. And, and people who work there as well. They uh, put together the funding and they orchestrated the building of a hospital and they wanted it to be a large stone hospital employing a lot of those masons who had learned their stone mason craft from Beer Kemper and from other uh, masons who had traveled through that area. Some of them were Italian immigrants. And they built this, what they call the Sage Memorial Hospital which was funded by the Russell Sage Foundation but he thought it was a fitting name as well since there was so much sagebrush. And what you're seeing here, this image is from the opening of the hospital in 1930. Uh, you will notice that there are uh, some cars there, but way more horses and wagons for the people who showed up. And that was the, the state of things at that time. Uh, Chi Dodge, who was the first Navajo tribal chairman showed up and gave a speech about this institution providing very important service to the people at that time. And uh, that building stands to this day, it's still there in Ganado, you see it when you drive in. Uh, there is a small annex that's been added to it on its east side, but it also is, uh, it's very recent to the, the building itself. It doesn't, you, you can't tell that it's added because it's the same stonework. And now uh, Salisbury had this hospital, but he wanted more and more people to come to it, which they had kind of refused or they had were reluctant to do uh, because as the book begins, Salisbury had his uh, first surgery patient come to a smaller hospital that had been there prior to this one being built. And uh, had, this patient had died. It's very sad. They died of an embolism during the the operation and so people he was almost murdered that night by her family actually the only reason that he 
probably wasn't killed was a local medicine man, a Hatashle named, Hash, uh, his name was Hastin Lechid Zahir, they call him Mr. Redpoint or Miguelito, he was sometimes called, intervened on his behalf and made it so that the work could continue. And so this is part of that continuation of the work. But he did understand that he could not coerce people, people were gonna choose their way of life, but he could work through the local people, the young women to make them nurses. This was one of his ideas, an idea that was not really supported by the powers that be that he interacted with in the government and in the Presbyterian church. I know I've read the letters, I've read the correspondence back and forth and that's what's in it. Uh, and then uh, also uh, he wanted to work through local medicine men as well. And so uh, that was part of his vision and why he wanted to get nurses in this hospital. So uh, next image. Okay, so the people living around him, they were living rural lives. That's why I included this. This is a, a postcard actually that was in the gift shop. He, he set up a small gift shop there at Ganado Mission for people visiting. And uh, this was a postcard image you could buy of a local woman butchering sheep. And they were engaging in their life ways and Salisbury uh, was supportive of those. In fact, uh, I've seen all the ledger sheets of how people paid their tuition because they could go to the local government school or they could go to Ganado Mission. Ganado Mission gave local people more access to their kids, to their nieces, nephews. It kept them in Ganado, not too far away, uh, rather than sending them far away from to a, to a government school. The children there at the school were able to keep private property, grow their hair long. They weren't wearing two sets of coveralls standard issue of the government they had they could buy their own clothes and were encouraged to do this so they could become americans you know they, they could become part of the mainstream america become private property owners become uh, generators of wealth for themselves and uh, learn english and so uh, women such as this who probably had a niece or a nephew or a relative at that school because this is from ganado uh you're looking partly at payment for the tuition because they, they didn't used to charge tuition. And then when they did, they thought, oh, we're probably not gonna have as many students coming to the school anymore. Well, it, that didn't happen. People kept paying the tuition, but they paid it often in cords of wood and in mutton. Uh, I, some people paid in cash, but I've seen all the ledgers year to year to year to year, and they have it written down in the account books. And most of it's mutton and wood. That, that's what a lot of people would pay with and labor as well they might loan their labor so that their uh so that people who eventually became the nurses at that school they went to that elementary school first that was the first inception of it and then beyond that they they entered the nursing school so they had that kind of feeder program from the local people uh, bringing in what they call uh yode like hard goods you know items of value such as this uh, next image Uh, yeah, this image comes from one of the many adobe buildings on the property. Uh, you have many local workers coming into the site. I think uh, this image is actually from a couple of the, the young men going off to war. They were drafted and they were going to be joining the military. Uh, I selected this image because it gives us a slice of life of the many workers involved. Uh, the students really were the work crews at this school. Many of them, when they were young women, were also the nurses. So. And these are many of their relatives. Uh, next image. Oh, okay. Yeah, I should explain this image. So what you're seeing here is uh, one of the things that happened that, that really unified Ganado Mission and got the word out uh, to make it easy to recruit women to come to the school was in 1930, it was a strange year. That hospital was built and set up, Juan Lorenzo Hubble died of old age. He was buried that year. And they had the most intense snowstorms on record, I think maybe in Ganado ever, where you had like six foot snow drifts and people were being trapped out in the middle of nowhere. And what they ended up having to do was to close down every building in that compound of Ganado Mission. And they put all the power and all the heat from a steam heat plant they had at the hospital. And so everyone who lived on that area came to the hospital and they were 
kind of all hunkered together, sleeping there through this intense snowstorm, this little like Noah's Ark riding out the snowstorm there. And what you're seeing in this image is a group of the mission young men uh, going and cutting down sheep corral wood and loading it up onto wagons to take it, to use it to stoke the boilers, to create the steam heat, to run the place and keep the electricity going in the hospital to treat sick people during that time. So it was a very unifying moment. A lot of people I interviewed or read interviews of remembered that time. And that's when people kind of really threw their support behind the, the hospital there. Uh, next page. Uh, I included this image uh, to show the productivity of the place. It was known as a place that would produce quite a lot of produce. Uh, it was a very vibrant um, location, made it appealing for nurses to come to school there. The man you're seeing there on top of that stack of squash and melons is a man named George Peters, who was an immigrant from what we now call Iran. And he spoke some Navajo, he spoke some English, but he was very adept farmer. He'd grown up in the desert and uh, had taught many people in that area uh, how to use irrigation canals that came from Ganado Lake and irrigate their crops. And he was very successful, as you can see. And local people learned these techniques as well, and they often outdid the mission farm, actually. But I just wanted to include that. I think that's important. Okay. Next page. Uh, yes, so this is a uh, image of horse and buggy. Uh, the women you're seeing there are relatives of, uh, of a nurse. You can see the nurse standing there, they're white on, uh, their white clothing. And it's just, a, you saw a lot of images of this, of um, the nurses embracing this new way of learning with the old ways. And they would, people knew what was happening. They knew a transition was taking place. Uh, there at that nurse's school, which was uh, set up and founded the same year the hospital went online in 1930. So next page. Uh, once again, uh, this was just another part of the mythos of this. So the, what, what supported this idea of nurses being trained, being uh, educated in new ways, you had a lot of things in the literature, the publicity, material of Ganado and here you have you know uh, the, the Navajo man on his horse with these three doctors who had come in from uh, uh, actually it was an airfield at Ganado and they would fly up from Phoenix and do clinics there at the hospital to treat people free operations and through surgery they're kind of donating their time to do that in the new wild west as they saw it so that that adventurous spirit of getting out into this unknown place people were really intrigued by that and it led to a lot of the uh, funding and the mystique of Ganado Mission. So next page. And so this was the mission uh, at the time when most of the nursing students were going to school there. And uh, all that interest, all that um, funding led to what you see here. Uh, you can see in the middle of the image that smokestack and it was burning coal, generating electricity. They had their own power plant there producing that. Uh, they had the farm fields, as you can see off to the left, they grew most of their own food and produced most of their own milk. This was also the school, by the way, where one of the nurse's uh, relatives had gone. His name was uh, Rudy Gorman. The world knows him as R.C. Gorman, the famous Navajo artist who's often called the Picasso of the Southwest. He graduated from this school and worked at the dairy farm. There's a couple funny stories I could tell you about him, but I'll, I'll keep moving so that we are okay on time. But uh, he called, you know, I did not put this in the book because I didn't learn this until I read a, um, a book about... R.C. Gorman called, uh, ah, I can't remember the name of it. I've got it on my shelf, but it's his, his salute to his people. And it's a, it's a large like coffee table book volume. But in that book, he said Ganado Mission was the best school he ever attended. Uh, he, he really uh, learned how to be an artist there through encouragement of as many teachers. And he loved working uh, outside on the farm. But his, his uh, aunt, who was one of his models, was one of the more trusted nursing students who went there. And we'll get to her, I'm sure. Next uh, image. Uh, yes, yeah, so what you're seeing here is a graduation ceremony for a group of the nursing students. The first two nurses were uh, Ruth Henderson and uh, Adele Slivers. 
And Adele Sliver's family went back long into Hubble's history. Her relatives were medicine men, uh, her, her father was, and they worked for Hubble. They were well understood to be, you know, clear, intelligent thinkers. And so when they were looking for people from uh, the community to start this nursing school, uh, she was a no brainer uh, choice. She was, I, I've seen her grades from when she was in school and she was very bright. She took to English very quickly and Ruth Henderson did as well. And uh, they were able to learn the curriculum, become accredited and work in the hospital and then eventually became trainers of the other nurses. So the, the group you're seeing here, because they are uh, poised there outside the nursing, I believe that's the nurses school. I think, yes, it is, or, or the uh, nurses uh, home. So they built that, that home right next to the hospital for them with local Navajo Masons. So they would have a mere four minute walk and their lives were under the control of the hospital and its institution. It wasn't like, like college today. My, my sister, Ajaba, uh, she's a nurse. She's born there in Ganado and she's, a, you know, she, she's an RN and she has a way more free life than these young women did at that time. I mean, they, they were monitored and like, you know, no dating allowed, all those rules that were there in place for pretty much any professional woman in the early 1930s. Uh, you know, you, you, you go to dinner this time, you go to work this time and all very regulated. Um, and, uh, but the, the this home there made it so they had an easy walk from the nurse's home to the hospital institution, which was the model at that time. I know nurses here in Taos who were educated under that model where you worked in the hospital and you didn't spend a lot of time in the college classroom. Okay, next image. Uh, yes, and so this is a postcard image. Uh, the, the nurses, once they became established there in their, uh, they had a navy blue uh, coat in their uniforms. This is a photo taken. Uh, it was a postcard for the Santa Fe Railway, uh, exposing, showing the uh, kind of lively energy of these young women, uh, pushing these boundaries, learning these new skills, proving, uh, because this is one of the, you know, the, the racism of the time that Salisbury dealt with was that, you know, people would say, you know, red women are not going to wear white. They're, they're savages. They're not intelligent enough. They lack the mental capacity to do this work. And he, and he would hear this, these sort of things. And he said, well, that's nonsense. I live with Navajo people. They're very intelligent. They've uh, saved my butt from trouble many times. And uh, that is not acceptable. And so part of this was a philosophical statement on his part to show that these women had the intelligence that, uh, and this this is where that kind of Protestant Christian perspective of like we're you know we are all children under God, we are all made in the image of God. That that was a mythos he drew on quite a lot and would repeat. And so uh, through his common his perspective, what we now call maybe like a Christian humanism, uh, he thought this project was worthy, and it yielded about 150 graduates in that time in that 20 year span. So next uh, page. Uh, yeah, this is an image uh, of the nurses in their tasks. Uh, Nita Salazar is in the background there. Uh, they're the, the nurses that actually have the, the white. The student nurses be wearing like a light blue with a white collar and they're working on a dummy patient here. So these are some images from their uh, training and how to administer drugs, how to uh, check for a pulse, how to check for temperature. You can see the dummy's arm kind of standing up there and kind of hanging out like that. Something I did not notice till this very webinar, which is really weird. I, did, I didn't ever notice that little hand there. And I assume that uh, she's showing them how to operate a certain instrument to, mon to monitor the vitality of a patient. But uh, no, no other descriptor here. I've, I showed some of these to my mom, to my sister, to other doctors I knew. And, and you know, they helped me at times, but this one, they, it was all speculative. So next image. Uh, so who you're seeing here is Charlotte Adele Slivers, a uh, very interesting woman who I mentioned was the first graduate from Ganado School of Nursing, the Ganado Mission School of Nursing, as it was known, uh, left there, a uh, very independent woman, uh, didn't take crap from people, not even Dr. Salisbury. And when the opportunity came to serve in the Army Air Corps, the, uh, the nursing corps, in the, what was then called the Army Air Corps, became the Air Force. Uh, she uh, 
took the opportunity. She served in the Pacific Theater and the European Theater where she met her husband, who was an airman, and uh, met him. Uh, he, he was a uh, flying missions out of Italy at the time. His name was Charlie Griggs. And uh, this is an image she sent home to her family, who you know her family let me use, uh, showing her in her uniform. And she became a lieutenant and was a very capable uh, field nurse during that time. Uh, escaped a Japanese internment camp, uh, it was kind of a little prison camp in the jungle there in the Philippines, and she was able to escape from there. And uh, very interesting lady. I never got to meet her. She passed away the year I moved to Ganado, actually, of, of natural causes. She lived to be rather elderly. But a uh, very interesting woman and, and was very much used in the, the promotional material about the nursing school uh, as a model of what could be. And if you're curious to read a shorter version, I wrote a profile about her for the Navajo Times a couple of years back. So you could probably Google that and, and be able to find it. Okay, next image. Uh, so who you're seeing here is somebody who probably shouldn't have gone to that school, according to current wisdom at the time. So much of uh, the time that the School of Nursing was operating was during that time when Germany had a lot of conflicts. Japanese had a lot of conflicts with America. And of course, World War II breaks out. Uh, 1941, U.S. gets involved. And as you may know, during that time, uh, Japanese Americans were forced into internment camps. And so the person you're seeing here is Sally Mizokame, who was in a Japanese internment camp in Tucson, Arizona. Dr. Salisbury had heard that she had a talent. Uh, she's a very intelligent person. He did not agree. He, he wrote many editorials not agreeing with the internment camp policy. He, he was not a, uh, he, let's say this, uh, Anyone who would argue with me that the United States did not have fascist tendencies during World War II, I would highly advise them to read more. Um, we certainly had it uh, in, our, in our national character at that time. There have been many historians who've argued that, you know, uh, fascism won World War II, essentially, the, the fusion of corporate and government forces coming together. And uh, as part of that, though, uh, you know, we, we imprisoned people. He is not a fan of the A-bomb being dropped. He, he supported doctors who spoke out against that. He was not for nuclear weapons. And so uh, this, this young woman, when uh, he had heard that she was in an internment camp, he pulled strings with the military and got, found a way to get her out of there and brought her uh, to um, the school. And she became a nursing student there and, uh, and actually uh, graduated from there and uh, scored the highest score on the Arizona nursing boards exam the year she graduated and uh, set a really high standard and was beloved on the campus uh, with the, uh, the nurses there and with the staff. The staff, many of whom were uh, mission workers, a lot of them weren't, weren't born in America. Uh, the, the doctor who ran the nursing school, for example, was actually born in Chile. His name was uh, William Duncan Spinning. He, if you saw him, you'd see you know, an Anglo man, but he spoke fluent Spanish and uh, spent a lot of his time in South America before coming up into America. He was a very talented doctor and uh, kind of a high strung individual, but very creative and well beloved by the by his students who were the, the nurses there. So next image. Uh, yes, yeah, so you're seeing this image. Th this image was on a lot of material when I was growing up in Ganado, this image of the old ways meeting the new ways. And there's something in this image that prompted other people, uh, you know, people to say like, you know, th these new ways were perhaps excluding the traditional ways. And uh, there's some truth to that. I mean, the campus, I, mean, I interviewed uh, many students who had gone to school there and read many oral histories with students there. And, you know, they, they, they loved their teachers at this school. They loved the people who ran it. They really enjoyed them. They had nothing but fond memories. And they would also tell you, we were not allowed to speak our language there. Uh, you know, we'd be punished. We had to dig graves if we talked English, if we talked Navajo, if they caught us. Uh, that, that was unpleasant, um, and uh, we didn't appreciate that, but we really liked the people at the same time. So it was this very interesting mix of emotions. Uh, but uh, as an investigator of this material, which is what I considered myself to be, I was just trying to figure out what are people saying, report what they're saying. Uh, I, I also was wondering about that. How much hostility would there be? 
people had all sorts of projections they put on me when I would come to their door and ask them about their time there. Like, is this somebody who's pushing missionary work? Is this somebody who's pushing civil rights? You know, whatever it would be. I, I would just try to be as neutral as possible and report on it. But uh, what I found overall was a goodwill toward the instructors, uh, an understanding of the historical moment they were in. A lot of the Navajo students who went to that nursing school, who graduated, became nurses. And if you go to the next image here, uh, I think this image kind of says a lot of it. This was a lot of the attitude. Here you see these uh, young women who are just graduated. This is the last class of the nursing school and they're celebrating and they're very happy. They're through all their, uh, their, their training and all this work they would do because they worked uh, many more hours than the average nursing student at the time, which was one reason the nursing school could not continue. It's in a very rural place. Post-World War II, the economy is thrumming along People have access to cars. They don't want to live out in the middle of nowhere. They want to live where they want to live, which is usually in the city where things are exciting. You can't get nursing uh, people who just got out of the war to work for a below competitive salary in the middle of nowhere, Ganado mission. And so they could not get instructors to continue the school ultimately. But the instructor you're seeing there in the middle in his suit and tie is uh, Dr. Spinning getting rabbit eared by his uh, native students behind him, of course, you can see the little bunny ears over his head. And uh, that kind of goodwill uh, was also propagated by Dr. Joseph Ponsel, who you see off, he's in the doorway off to the left. He became the superintendent managing the, the institution that Dr. Salisbury had left him when Dr. Salisbury retired in 1950 and went on to become the head of the public health department for the state of Arizona. So very capable physician and a politician as well. So next image. I'm just looking at our time, making sure we're going along. Okay, I think this is the final image and I'd, I'd love to hear questions. Uh, questions are great. Uh, this image is in front of the nursing home. Uh, they did these, they, they staged these images every year to show the graduates who are coming to the school. And here you can see starting to the left, you have graduates from China. They had connections with people in China, uh, which was of course undergoing political turmoil and change at that time. And so they got people out of China to come to school here. Uh, people who are Klamath, who are uh, Hopi, Sioux. You'll probably notice names for uh, native tribes in some of these sashes that are no longer used or they're used more specifically. Um, you have people who would be considered Spanish or Spanish American, we'd now say Hispanic. This photo would have been taken uh, probably in 1943 is what I, what I figure could be. I'm saying that because it might've been 19, might've been 1941. It's hard to say, there's no date on it, but I, I assume that because you see Dr. Salisbury there in the dark tie with the X over his head. And then uh, right next to him is his right-handed uh, it, you know, kind of his right hand student who was the head of nursing at that time, which was Adele Slivers who has the Navajo sash and she has a blue handkerchief in her pocket there. And uh, these were the charges that she was promoting and moving and she was the head surgical nurse there at Sage Memorial working directly with him. Uh, and there were several other photos of these uh, groups, um, but I, I chose this one just for, uh, for the sake of the PowerPoint. So uh, next image. Oh, I was right, it is the last one. I haven't looked at the PowerPoint in a while. All right, so that, that's, that is a very, very, very brief, quick, quick, quick way of talking about all this material. I tried to use the images to maybe demonstrate some uh, ideas or provoke some thoughts and happy to hear your thoughts and questions. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Jim. So much to digest there and yeah, be very excited to read your read your the entire book. Um, so we do have a couple questions. Um, one around uh, the shift in in gender roles at that time was do you have a sense of of how uh, more traditional um, medicine men felt about uh, this sort of uh, explosion of of nurse, nursing and nurse training? Oh, OK. That's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, so I'll give you a story. Uh, there is a man who was a local medicine man named, I said his name, Hastin Lechidazahi, Red Point. And he came, he was invited, he showed up in his traditional 
yellow shirt, purple headband. You know, he would look like your traditional medicine man. He brought his medicine basket. There's photos of him being there. And he came to the first graduation uh, of the nursing school. And he spoke in Navajo. And then the uh, interpreter interpreted for him as did some of the nursing students. This is basically, I'll summarize what he said. He said, every day this winter, I have been out on cold nights and cold mornings, like General Washington crossing the Delaware, enduring the cold for the liberty of his people. And I did this to build the foundation, this stone foundation next to this hospital for the nurses home, for the nurses will have a place to live and embrace this new way. I mean, so that's straight from him. So that uh, the medicine men, they had no uh, push against it at that time. I don't know how it is now, um, but at that time, it was very much like, this is a way forward for our young people. And, and, and people like, Pastin Tlachi de Zahi, you know, he he was on the long walk. He wow. he was he was a young boy at that time, moving through it. And and so they had those memories of that time. And, and so for them it was like more prosperity the better. We never going back to this ever again. And, and so that was very much alive in the in the way they saw the world. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um uh, we have uh let's see. A couple of questions uh, coming in. Um, uh, they were. We have uh, some folks curious about um, how large was the the teaching staff, and were there multiple subjects taught? Did they bring in sort of uh, specialists for more yeah. advanced topics? Oh, good. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I couldn't tell you offhand uh, very specifically, but it is in the book because I found the curriculum guide and all of that is in there and how many people were employed and what they were taught and all the curriculum. So that is in the book because I did find that material. I just can't recall it off the top of my head. Um, but a lot of the instructors were, uh, were women for the nursing portion, uh, women from New Mexico uh, who were Hispanic. Um, the doc, there were certain doctors, like I said, Dr. Spinning ran a lot of the courses. Dr. Salisbury did a lot of the surgical courses. Uh, the specialists, they did bring many doctors in to do clinics and the nurses would go to their clinics mm -hmm. and learn as much as they could at that time. They, uh, they, I didn't even get to talk about this in the PowerPoint, but they would basically stage a what they called a Chautauqua, which is a based on the Chautauqua statement, this idea of like a learning village. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would do that every year. Many historians argue was what led to the creation of the Navajo Nation Fair, that same concept. And they were doing that in 1927, 1928, 1929, all the way through for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Doctors would come in, some of them from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Harlow Brooks, who was a very famous physician, you could look him up. Uh, he basically credited with um, discovering gangrene, like what causes gangrene. Mm -hmm how it works because he was a world war one veteran and uh and spent a lot of time with native american people he, he actually rode across the plains four times on horseback and was uh mentored by a native american man uh where he grew up there in, on the in the, in the great plains in, in the midwest but he was a, a a constant visitor and a constant supporter uh you know, a lot of a lot of physicians came out there from Harvard, the Mayo Clinic, because they wanted to study the local population mm -hmm. because they had almost no cases of diabetes at that place. They're like the Navajo place. They have no diabetes. They have no cancer. What's going on? And so they did these studies and came out to observe them. So the nurses would have interacted with those people as well in regards to specialists. But they did not have. Um, yeah, they didn't. Uh, it, Dr. Salisbury said this. He said there was not a single day at that institution where we operated at full staff. There was not a single day, wow. Wow. not one day. And so the, the students, the nursing students often made up the slack and they certainly overworked people. I think there's a chapter in the book called the, the slave camp because that's mm -hmm. what it was like working there. You just worked and worked and worked because they had no one else to cover. You know, And that's partly what drove people away from the institution because to this day, it's hard to find people to work out there. You know, it's, it, it's tough. Right. Which is uh, actually kind of, um, and, and maybe we'll 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 close on this one. Um, but Taylor will uh, email you uh, the rest, of the the ones that we don't have time to get to. But okay. uh, uh, 
did did the nurses who were trained did they uh do you know if many of them s stayed to serve uh in their own communities uh, on the reservation or if they went on to okay. other opportunities you know what um i have a theory they would have if um the presbyterian church had stayed current because what did happen i noticed this trend and this is my opinion uh, this is speculative, what I'm going to say. Uh, they did come back, many of them. Uh, and that was the goal. Salisbury wanted that. He wanted them to return and, and, you know, and, and help their people. And they did do that, but they didn't last long at Ganado Mission, their mm -hmm. alma mater. And I think this was for two reasons. Number one, they, weren't, they, they didn't have any incentives to stay there financially. They could go get a government job at an IHS, what became IHS hospital in Shiprock or Window Rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they would make much more money and they were given much more. It was easier. It was easier. They would go to these government jobs and go, oh my God, this is so easy compared to <laughs> working for the Presbyterian Church. And the other thing was that they, um, I, I think the Presbyterians uh, burnt some bridges with people um, in terms of... Um, I don't want I don't want to use the word moralism, but um, when you're when, when how you would want to date someone or meet someone to get married to them, that was impinged on several times in the mm -hmm. correspondence. And they had a very uh, excellent nurse who was there, for example, who they, um, they they expelled her because she was seen walking with a man. Wow. Uh, so that that aspect it didn't, well, it, I mean, you, and I'm not, I'm not saying it was wrong for them because it's their institution. They can do what they want with it. But as times changed and the preferences of the average person changed, um, the Presbyterians did not continue with that, which led to their, uh, and their church split over it. I mean, you know, this all happened in the late 60s over Martin Luther King Jr. and over progressive policies at the time. Some of the church was cool with it. Some of the church didn't want anything to do with it. And so they that led to the split that did happen. And so those elements uh, made it tough for the local people would come back. They did come back, but then they wouldn't stay. That, that's what ended up happening. Yeah. Well, what a spectacular presentation. Lots of, of compliments you. in the chat. And I'm, I bet that the few questions that we didn't get to could be answered by reading uh, your new forthcoming publication. So uh, well, I encourage everyone, and we will certainly be, be reading it here at Crook Indian. And Jim, you are welcome anytime. Come up and talk to us about many things. And, uh, our, our folks are very interested in sustainable building out here too. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be in touch. That, that'd be great. Because I've never I've always seen the archaeological center on Google Maps, but I've never been up there. So that, that'd be Oh, that'd absolutely. Be we would love to give you a tour and, and spend a little time talking. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so yeah. much. You as well. Thank you.